Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So let's start uh, now. You know, I've always been sitting out there. This is my first time on this side of the room, and it's quite scary. <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess I can't say welcome anymore, because by now, hopefully, you're settled in. But it's really been a pleasure to meet most of you. I still haven't met all of you. So hopefully, in the next week, uh, I have the chance to talk to all of you. Um, yesterday, you had a presentation about ICTP by Stefano. Uh, if you have any questions about ICTP or you'd like to chat about the diploma program especially, uh, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, I am not, not from the perspective of a student, um, but as uh, I'm a postdoc here and uh, I at least can help a little bit with maybe the application process or some of the things that I know about it and the experience of students with whom I've talked. Um, anyway. Okay, so today I'm going to do an introduction to ergodicity. So probably many of you have seen most of what I'm going to say. Uh, and tomorrow Davide will do ergodic theorems. Um, but ergodicity is something extremely important in dynamics and also in other fields, like for example, even in probability theory. So, uh, okay, but I will do it mostly from a dynamics perspective. So. I would like to a little bit motivate why we care about this concept of ergodicity. And then I would like to define it and hopefully work through some examples to show some various techniques that are used to prove whether a system is ergodic or not. So, okay, so just to, I guess <laughs> it's almost happened at the beginning of every class, but to remind you our setup, uh, we have some space, some set X, uh, we have the Borel sigma algebra, the measurable sets of x. We have a transformation from x to x, and we have a probability measure. And I'm going to assume that mu is uh, t invariant. So I'm going to assume now that we're always talking about a measure preserving transformation. And I'm going to write MPT so that I don't have to write measure preserving transformation every time. Okay? So, okay, so let's suppose, so suppose there's a set, um, suppose there's a set A uh, such that A is a T invariant set, so such that T inverse of A equals A, and suppose that it has positive measure but strictly less than one, so zero A less than one, okay? So the X looks something like this, maps X to X, and let's say I have some set A that's T invariant, so I can decompose X like A union A complement, okay? So, well, let me consider a conditional measure, mu A, defined by mu, a set intersection A over mu of A. And I can do the same thing with respect to A complement. So I have mu A complement of the set, mu intersect A complement here, and one minus mu the measure of A. So I can do this, right? Yes, okay. Uh, it's clear to everyone that these are probability measures still. Yes? Okay. And maybe it's not so obvious, but they're also still T invariant measures. So let me show that. So if I take mu A, this will be mu. A. Now I'm assuming that A is T invariant, so I can replace A by T inverse of A. So I have mu T inverse of A, A. And I can pull out T inverse inverse of the intersection, and mu is T invariant, so this is the same as mu of B intersection A over mu of A, which is exactly mu A of B. Okay? And this is the same for mu uh, restricted to A complement, yes? So now I have decomposed mu 
into two p invariant probability measures. Yes? So if I think of restricting t to a and t to a complement, then I have, can decompose this measure preserving system into two separate measure preserving systems. So uh, this characterization that we would like to find is one when a system cannot be decomposed. So there's an analogy drawn sometimes between uh, herbatic systems and prime numbers. So you decompose every integer into the prime numbers, right? It's factorization because the prime numbers are things that you can't really decompose further. So we think of these measure preserving ergodic systems as the units, the building blocks of other things, the things that cannot be reduced anymore. Okay? So that's one motivation. So we want to find a characterization for when this cannot happen. And maybe you already have in mind which property here, but before I actually introduce the definition, let me give a, the same but a slightly different characterization of this. So, so I'm going to denote by m x t the space of t invariant probability measures on x. Okay. So one thing about this space is that it's convex. So m x t is convex. What does that mean? So that means that if I take lambda between 0 and 1, any two elements, so if I take mu 1, mu 2, and m, their linear combination is also still an m. So mu 1, lambda mu 1 plus 1 minus lambda mu 2 is still an element of m. Okay. So this space has this very nice property. And extremal points of a convex space, so an extremal point, so mu is m, if it can't be written as a non-trivial linear combination of other elements in the space, right? So if whenever uh, mu equals lambda mu 1 plus 1 minus lambda mu 2 for lambda strictly between 0 and 1, then mu equals mu 1 equals mu 2. Okay? So there is a characterization as well as the extremal points of the space of T invariant probability measures are the ergodic measures. Okay? So I haven't proven that. It's probably clear from this decomposition that extremal points are ergodic measures, but the other way needs to be shown too. I think the proof goes if you're not an extremal point, then you're not ergodic, but the proof requires a little bit more than I want to discuss here. However, I'm happy to talk about it later in the exercise session. Um, okay. So if I would like to prevent this decomposition from happening, what is the property here that I would have to change? Or what is the property here that allows me to write these conditional, pro these conditional probabilities? Um, so I, I want to keep, I will have invariant sets. So I, I, I mean, I want to keep a, a comment about invariant sets here. But what's the property of the invariant set here that allowed me to put this? Yes, right? OK, so that is between 0 and 1. So if the measure of A were 1, then the measure of its complement would be 0. And I would have a problem here, right? And if the measure of A were 0, then I would have had a, prop a problem here, yes? OK, so this is kind of the motivation for the first definition. So 
a measure preserving transformation is ergodic if for every set, so if for every set that's T invariant, so for every set A that of A equals A, the measure of A is zero or one. Okay? Okay, so there are other ways of characterizing ergodicity or perhaps using this definition to come up with equivalent statements for different objects. So let me introduce the, well, let me give you a claim. So measure preserving, so sorry, MPT, ergodic, only if every, am I writing large enough? Can you guys see in the back? Yes? Okay, thanks. If for every measurable function f, say from x to r for now, um, such that f composed with t equals f, f is constant almost everywhere, okay? So you can see that we have gone from a characterization in terms of sets to a characterization in terms of functions, okay? I'm going to prove this claim as written but just to make a comment, you can replace measurable by L1 or L2 here. And I should put this as mu almost everywhere. And this invariance can also be mu almost everywhere. Then you can extend it uh, pretty easily, okay? But for now, the statement in white is what I would like to prove. So we go from a characterization of sets to a characterization of functions. These are kind of the two that I'm going to work with today. But I would like to say that you can also go further to a characterization in terms of operators. So if you look at this uh, composition as an operator acting on L2, um, it's a linear operator, it's an isometry, it preserves the L2 norm. And the characterization of ergodicity is that uh, any eigenfunction corresponding to the eigenvalue one is a constant function almost everywhere. So it may be unclear what you gain from that, but uh, once you introduce a setting where you can use functional analysis, it becomes extremely useful. So um, actually the third characterization is also very important, but I won't go more into that today. Okay, so let me prove this claim. Okay, so let's go this direction. So I suppose my measure preserving transformation is ergodic, and I want to show that any T invariant function is constant almost everywhere, okay? So let me take a function F composed with T that equals F, and I want to show that this is constant, yes? Okay. So let me consider the following sets. AT is the set of all X's in X, such that F of X is okay. First of all, is this a measurable set? Why do I know it's a measurable set? Yes, it's a pre-image of the interval t to infinity, right? F I'm assuming is measurable. So this is a measurable set. Now, just a comment. If F is not constant over almost everywhere, then it takes at least two different values, right, on some positive measure sets, right? So for some t, if the function is not constant, for some t, 
this is going to be a positive measure set that doesn't have full measure, right? So if I want to show that f is constant almost everywhere, I need to show that every such set a t has either measure 0 or measure 1. Okay. So that's good because I'm assuming ergodicity. So the only thing I have to show is that these sets are t invariant sets. And then I, you know, I use this definition one. So let's do t inverse of a of t. Well, this is the set of x and x such that t of x is in a of t. Well, I can write this also as the set of x and x such that f composed with t of x is greater than t. Well, I'm assuming that f is t invariant. So this is just the set of x such that f of x is greater than t. And now I've returned to it just being a t. Okay? So these are indeed invariant sets, which is good news for us because that means that they have only, so mu of a is 0 or 1, which implies f constant. Okay, so we have proved the first direction. Is it clear? Okay, let's prove the other direction. direction being I'm going to assume that any uh, t invariant function is constant almost everywhere and I want to show ergodicity. Yes? Okay. So let me take a t invariant set A. So let uh, A, B, and B set of A equals A. Now, a good way always to go between sets and functions is to consider uh, characteristic functions, right, of the set. So let me think about composing the characteristic function of A with the transformation T. What do I get? I get the characteristic function of which set? Of? Not A. T inverse of A, right? I want all the points that would be mapped into A under T, under one iterate of T, right? So this is the indicator function of T inverse of A. Now I chose A to be a T, to be T invariant set, so this is just the indicator function of A. Yes, right? Now I'm assuming that any T invariant function is constant almost everywhere. The indicator function can only take two values, right? Zero or one. So either, so, me, uh, either it's uh, equal to zero almost everywhere, which means that the measure of a, which I can get by integrating over the space the characteristic function of the set d mu, is going to be zero. Or I get that this is one almost everywhere, which then implies that the measure of the set for the same reason So that proves ergodicity. So we have now just proven this claim. Is it clear? Okay, so let's do a few examples to actually see how we use these characterizations and definitions in practice. So the first example I'm going to do is an example you've been seeing a lot about. So I'm just going to do circle rotations. So example one, 
probably the only example I will work through fully. So rotations. So recall that uh, the rotation, we, I guess we say it maps from R mod Z to R mod Z. And for now, let me assume that we are talking about the Lebesgue measure. And I'm going to use, I'll use additive notation for now. So I have x plus theta mod 1, where we can have e to the 2 pi i x, to the 2 pi x plus theta. Uh, OK, and so let me consider first the case where theta is rational. Okay, and to do an absolutely explicit example, let me take theta to be 1 fourth. Okay, so uh, let, me uh, let me construct this set A in the following way. So I'm going to take 0 to 1 eighth. I'm going to take 1 fourth to 3 eighths. I'm going to take 1 half to 5 eighths. And I'm going to take 3 fourths to 7 eighths. If I draw this on my circle, Okay, so under the rotation with theta equals one fourth, what happens to this first interval? Where does it get sent? To the next one, right? And this one gets sent to the next one. And this one gets sent to the next one. Okay, so what can I say about A under T? Sorry? Yes, in terms of in terms of the of how I'm saying a set acts under T, what does that mean for the whole set? It's invariant, right? Because I'm staying within here at each iterate, it's a T invariant set. Yes. So T inverse of A equals A. Now, what's the measure of A? One half, right? I'm considering the vague measure. It's one half, yes? What does that mean? Is this rational rotation ergodic with respect to the vague? No, right? I found a T invariant set that was had measure one half, so neither zero nor one. So it's not it's not ergodic. And in fact, for any theta that's rational, so any theta that's P over Q, you can always think of the set A union, I guess I goes from 0 to Q minus 1, uh, I over Q, 1, uh, I over Q plus 1 over 2 Q, something like this. So you can always construct, construct the analogous set for the appropriate rational number. And uh, this will be invariant, but it will have a positive measure and not measure 1, OK? So rational rotations are not ergodic with respect to Lebesgue. I have a question, though. Can you think of a measure for which this transformation is ergodic? Delta measure on what? You're close. I, so I want to, OK. Think about, so think about what you are saying with periodicity. Instead of considering sets here, let me consider, I don't know, for example, points in these sets. Let me take 0, let me take 1 fourth, let me take 1 half, let me take 3 fourths, right? This is an invariant set, right? Okay. What if I take a measure that's supported on this orbit? I need to ensure that every point has positive measure in here, but let's say the, the full support of the measure is here. What do you think? Do you think that's ergodic? Yes. Yeah, maybe you could, I don't know, you could put a measure 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 fourth. OK, I want the full measure to be just be supported on these points, but I want them to have positive measure each. OK, so 
What about this example? Yes, right? An invariant set must contain all of these points or none of these points. If you have only two of these points in a set or three of these points in a set, then its preimage is going to have different points. It's not going to be invariant. Okay? So, in fact, you can have, you can think of rotations as ergodic with respect to singular measures, measures that put positive measure on sets that are measure zero in the bank. Okay, so you wouldn't be losing that much in the rational case. In general, though, if you think of a system that has dense orbits as well as many periodic orbits and you consider such a measure, Yes, you might have ergodicity, but you also will be losing a lot of the interesting dynamics that are going on because you're kind of giving the rest measure zero. So I guess my point is that we first are considering probability measures. Then we say, okay, but important measures for us will be invariant with respect to the transformation. And then we say, okay, but we don't want to reduce, we won't, we don't want to be able to decompose our system further. So then we're considering ergodic invariant measures. But even ergodic invariant measures aren't necessarily all important for us. So there are still further characterizations of measures that are more relevant or less relevant for the system that you're considering. I don't know if anyone will talk about this in the rest of the school. But uh, anyway, just to keep that in mind. Okay. All right, so let me just say that I could show this using uh, the claim by thinking of a function that's not uh, T invariant, I mean a function that is T invariant that's not constant. So for example, let me take the function f of x equals e to the 2 pi i x cubed. So if I do f composed with t of x, I get e to the 2 pi i x, sorry, x plus theta, which is p over t. And this is e to the 2 pi i q of x and e to the 2 pi i p, which is 1. So I just get f of x back. So I can also find analogously to a t invariant set that has positive measure between 0 and 1, I can find a function that's t invariant that's not constant. Okay. okay. So I guess also I should mention, sometimes we oscillate between saying a measure preserving transformation is ergodic or a measure is ergodic, right? So this is not a measure preserving transformation if I consider Lebesgue, if it's rational, right? But it could be if I considered the measure that we discussed. So if you have, if the transformation is clear and you're trying to choose a measure, sometimes people just talk about ergodic measures. Um, so you'll hear it phrased in different ways. OK, let's consider theta being irrational, so theta not being in Q. Yes. Yes, sorry, I was talking about Lebesgue measure. Good, thank you. But yes. Other, uh, uh, yeah. But almost everywhere here is large, right? I mean, it's small. So, yeah, so anyway, but yes, I don't want this right now. That was just a, a comment, so let's forget about this. Now I'm back to Lebesgue. Okay, so. Let's consider the irrational case. I would like to use the invariant function characterization. I'm going to need the Fourier expansion of a function. Uh, does anyone want a quick explanation of Fourier series? Or can I just use it? No? Yes? OK. I'll just use it. Let me then just say briefly a few words just in case it's the first time you hear it. So I have here a function from, let's say, r mod z to r, or I consider, consider any function from r to r if it's periodic, let's say one period one for now. 
And I, wanna, I can decompose this function into its harmonics. So I write it in terms of uh, basic oscillatory functions like cosine 2 pi n x, sine 2 pi n x. And I look, I write it as a linear combination of these, right? And they have varying frequencies. And you add these up, and you can represent your function in this way, OK? And if you write these using in, in the complex way, you get a very nice, concise way of writing your function as a sum. So I'm going to take f, uh, f of x here. I can write it as n and z as uh, a n g to the 2 pi i and x. So it will look something like this. OK, so this is a way that I can represent my function. So, um, and something that you're going to need in one of the exercise I, exercises I give you today is the riemann lebesgue lemma. So if you have an L1 function, L1 periodic function on R, then uh, the Fourier coefficients go to 0 in modulus as n goes to infinity. Okay, so these guys, the norm of these guys go to 0 as n goes to infinity will be useful, I think, for one of the exercises later. But I'll write riemann lebesgue lemma to remind you guys. OK. OK, now, suppose that this f came from choosing. So I want to take an f that's t invariant, right? I'm taking an f that's t invariant under my irrational circle rotation. And then I write its Fourier expansion like this. So let me write then what f composed with t of x looks like. Just n and z, a n e to the 2 pi i n x plus theta. This is just a n e to the 2 pi i n theta, e to the 2 pi i n x. And I chose a t invariant function, so this must be equal to f, which means that this must be equal to a n e to the 2 pi i n x. So I have a property of Fourier series that if these are equal, then the coefficients are e the same for every n, its uniqueness. OK, so I have that this must be the same as this for every n. OK, so that means a n e to the 2 pi i n theta has to be equal to a n for all n. For n equals 0, I'm in good shape, trivially, yes? For n not equal 0, well, unfortunately, e to the 2 pi i n theta, it would have to be 1 for this to hold. Well, that's only true if theta is rational. Can only be true if theta is rational. So if I'm restricting theta to be irrational, this is never 1, right? So that means that all of my coefficients for n not equal to 0 are identically 0. So that means that my function is really just a naught. So that means it's constant, right? Oh, I've proved. OK. OK, so then by the claim, I've shown that irrational circle rotations are ergodic with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So Fourier series are really a crucial technique for proving ergodicity. Um, so today in the exercise session, I will ask you to prove that the doubling map that you've also been seeing a lot about is ergodic with respect to Lebesgue. And I would like for you to do it showing that invariant sets have measure 0 or 1. And I would also like for you to try to do it showing that uh, invariant functions are constant almost everywhere. And you will use the Fourier expansion, and you will use riemann lebesgue lemma. Try to do it in two different ways so you get used to the different techniques. OK. Yes. So, uh, So 
if f is in L1, I'll say, of x mu, yes? Then I look at, then I can write it like this. So I want this, let me, it has to be periodic in R, or it has to be from R mod Z to R. So I am taking x, let's just say, for our purposes, it's going to be 0, 1, OK? So I function uh, L1, uh, let me just put that here, since this is what our example will be. 2x mod 1 is 0, 1. Lebesgue measure mu. Then I write its Fourier expansion. And then you have the property that the modulus of the Fourier coefficients go to 0 as n goes to infinity. All right. Not you, not always. Okay. Maybe I mention things about LP spaces at the end and containment and things. Um, Yes, I'm mixing between using measurable L1 and L2. This is a claim that's true for L1 functions, right? Sorry, say again, I didn't hear you. Yes, I am. Yes, okay, yes, I am using a stronger claim. All right, so, all right, uh, okay. So let me introduce a third type of example. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the shift space that you've already seen defined in a particular setting by Hana, I think, yes? Example two, full shift. OK, so I like this example. Um, and this proving ergodicity for this will be the harder of the two exercises. I think it's really tricky. Maybe for some of you, it's easy. Um, but I like it because the invariant measure that we consider is not Lebesgue. So we leave a little bit the world of Lebesgue and we consider a different type of measure. So consider the, se uh, the set of sequences. They're infinite sequences. Everything I say is also true for one-sided, but I'm just going to assume we have two-sided sequences. And each coordinate of the sequence comes from some alphabet of k letters. I'm just going to denote them by numbers, 1 through k. And remember the shift map, sigma, little sigma, moves everything to the left, right? So the image under sigma of a sequence, I have a decimal or something marking at the place here. This will look like. So in the case of one side in sequences, I kind of don't, I don't have a left-hand side before the decimal, and I get rid of the leftmost coordinate. Yes? OK, so you're familiar more or less with this math. And if I want to define a measure on this space, so I think you saw a metric for this space. I want to just define a measure on the space. So I'm going to go back to what Oliver said and to what Irene said. You know, we have these sets that we care about. We have the Borel sets. And we really can, because of we have all these nice extension theorems, we can really just say things about the generators of the Borel sets and define things on the generators. And then it nicely extends to the whole space, right? So I want to 
do this because it will be easier for me to define the measure on just the generators of, the, of, the, of all the sets. But I need to find what these are. So in R or in 0, 1, the generators are intervals, right? But I need to find the analogous concept here. So what are my generators here? So generators in this space are cylinder sets. So these will be generators of the sigma algebra. And what do they look like? Well, cylinder sets are sets of sequences that are formed by fixing finite strings of symbols, okay? So you say from this point to this point, I want it to look like this, and then you're free outside of that, okay? So let me write this. I have YM to YN. This is the set of all X in sigma such that XI equals YI for all I between M and N. So these are my cylinder sets, these are my generators. I'm gonna think of everything in terms of this. So if I asked you to prove ergodicity of the measure I define, then you're gonna to have to look at sigma invariant sets. And a hint is that, well, the things we have to work with that we can say a lot about are the cylinder sets. So try to always approximate sets by cylinder sets or unions of cylinder sets. Okay. Okay, so now I need to define a measure on these. So let me take a probability vector, P1 to PK. So think of this like the probability I get one, the probability I get two, the probability I get K. So you can, if this is on two symbols, you can think of this as flipping a coin. If it's on six symbols, maybe it's like throwing a die. So, uh, these are independent, right? It doesn't, the probability of getting one of these symbols in a place doesn't depend on the place. Uh, each of these are positive and their sum is one. Okay, so with this I'm gonna define the product measure. So the measure of a cylinder will just be given by the product of the probabilities of each of these symbols, right? So this is gonna be P of YM multiplied all the way to P of YN. So this is my probability, this is my measure, sorry. And let me start off by at least showing to you that it's sigma invariant. So claim Q is sigma invariant. Okay, so let me consider mu of sigma inverse of ym to ym. Okay. What is the inverse image under sigma of this cylinder set? Yes, so let me just write it as a sequence. So I have ym to y n fixed, and you're saying, okay, since sigma moved to the left, sigma inverse is gonna move it to the right. So then I'm gonna have an open spot where I had y m, and everything was shifted to the right. And what can I put here? Anything in the alphabet, right? So this inverse image is sigma, as uh, mu, of the union from i goes from one to k, of now the new cylinder sets I, YM, YN. So I have full freedom. Once I shift it over, I can have anything there. All of those sets are in the pre-image of this cylinder set. Okay. Now, what can I say about each one of these cylinder sets? Do they have overlapping elements? No. Oh. Right? Because if I put, if I consider the sequences where I put one here, and then I consider the sequences where I put two here, well, they can't be in the same set. None of, none of sequences with one here are gonna have two here. So all of these cylinder sets are in fact disjoint. 
So I can write this as the sum of the measures of each of these new cylinder sets. Okay. And I have a probability for each one of these. They're, they're independent, so I can pull this probability out. I get the sum. I goes from 1 to k of pi mu times the probability of my original cylinder set. Now, because I have a probability vector, I said all of these guys add up to 1. So when I actually do this sum, this part goes away, and I'm just left with mu of my original cylinder set. Yes? OK. So it's indeed uh, sigma invariant. But it's a union of more cylinders. Other cylinder. I mean, is the right. union of two disjoint intervals an interval necessarily? I mean, I'm considering. I just, I'm I just considering. That you can, uh, maybe, sums. maybe so. Maybe so. Um, I, I need to think if there's something that pops up. I really want the cylinder sets to be, to, I want you to think of the cylinder sets as strings that are connected strings that are fixed. Not that you have one string fixed here and one string fixed here. So I just, it's, it's enough to consider this probability on the cylinders that have this, the, the string fixed in one place. I'm not, I mean, and then I can extend it for sure, but. So maybe there's another way to do this, but I wanted to do it with the basic building blocks. So uh, just to understand the difference. Barry? Yes. Yes. M can be negative. M and N are integers. So M could be minus 100 and N could be 2. So, yes. So, and so cylinder sets have fixed strings of different lengths, as long as you want, as short as you want. Okay. Okay. So your task today is to prove, yes. Ah, well, that, so the measure of that will be the probability of ym times the probability of ym plus 1, blah, 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 all the way to the probability of ym. This is the product of the probabilities. So my claim, and what I didn't show you, but what it follows from all these extension theorems that we're saying, if I define the, the measure on these generators, this extends to a measure on the space. Okay, I'm not showing this, but I'm claiming this from things that we've heard before as well. Um, so this is all, this is the information you need to know to show ergodicity in the exercise session. It's not an easy task, I think, but hopefully it's fun. Um, okay, that's all I have for ergodicity. Let me very briefly just tell you what uh, LP space is because it was, we realized that we're using these functions and we haven't defined them, uh, the spaces at all. So I think Davide will use L1 tomorrow, certainly. Okay. So I promise I will be very quick. So I have a measurable space here. And I take a measurable function. For now, let's say it's a real valued function. And I take P between 1 and infinity. So I define a norm on this function which looks like the integral over the space, the absolute value of the function raised to the p, integrated with respect to the measure mu, to the 1 over p. So this is a norm. And the space of functions, the LP space of functions, are all the measurable functions on x, such that the LP norm is finite. So this is what we mean by an L1 function or an L2 function. In fact, I think really all we're going to need is p equals 1 or 2 in general. Okay. Uh, I don't think we'll need, OK. I don't think we'll need L infinity functions. Um, one thing 
I think that's important. Well, these are vector spaces. And one property, nice property that we have because we're dealing with probability measures, so if mu is finite, then for one less than or equal to p less than q less than or equal to infinity, LQ is contained in LP. We have containment, so uh, this is nice for us. Okay. Want a proof of this? Are you no. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's all. So those are LP functions. I am done, and I will see you at two o'clock. So thank you. Thanks.